Welcome to today's 3D print. This is going to be an educational episode. I'm going to try to make it an educational episode. I think it might like better. Um, a user posted a question, legitimate question. Um, I think it was off the mark, but from his perspective it makes sense. So I'm going to try to provide information in this video to explain that. Um, he asked me to do something I can't do. He asked me to post a video. Um, he's like, you know, you show us these prints of all your magic tuned prints. You know, let's show us with the stock standard prints. The problem is that doesn't exist. There is no stock standard prints. Um, this is the first time I've actually re-recorded a video. The first video is 15 minutes long. I'm going to try to make it shorter. And I rambled and shifted and moved around a lot as I tried to figure out ways to explain things. And I think I've got a better way to explain it. Um, when you say stock settings, the confusion there is that there is no stock settings. There's no settings at all. You get a printer. So when you order a printer, you just get a printer. Now the printer does have software on it, but that software is simply for the mechanical systems on the printer, allowing you to address the steppers, the extruder, the bed, etc., the fans. So that software has no comprehension or understanding regarding printing something. So when you tell it you want to print something, it doesn't have a clue. Remember, these printers are dumb, deaf, and blind. You are giving them raw instructions. You are telling it, heat up to this temperature, move to this location, move here while extruding this much plastic, move here while extruding this much plastic, stop extruding plastic, move over here. That's all it is. So to print the roof of this benchy, you're going to tell it to go here, begin extruding, follow these coordinates to create this shape, stop extruding, move over to here, begin extruding, follow these coordinates to create this shape. The printer has no idea it's creating a benchy or a vase or a rocket or anything else. It's clueless. It's simply following literal instructions that you give it. Um, there are two sets of instructions that you have to feed to make a print. Um, this comes from G-code. The G-code is the instructions for the printer. Okay, Your slicer is used to make G-code. So you put an STL into your slicer, and then your slicer makes G-code. So we are talking about the instructions that go into slicer, not the instructions that go from the G-code to the printer, because the slicer makes the G-code. Okay? Now, so when you say stock settings, you're talking about this stock settings. Well, I'm only aware of one single printer manufacturer that has stock settings, and that's Prusa, because they have Prusa control, the software designed explicitly to run their printer. So that software comes programmed to print to their printer. You feed it STL files, and it knows how to make um, semi-optimized G-code for its own printers. Well, Creality has nothing to do with Simplify 3D, and they have nothing to do with Cura or Repetier Host or Slick 3R. Thanks, Tom. You've got me saying that now. <laughs> um, all they do is say, here's a printer that uses standard G-code. You have to figure out how to make this program make G-code appropriate for this printer or this printer or this printer. There are no standard instructions for that. Some give you basic instructions. I think Lulzbot provides basic profiles. I think um, um, Prusa provides basic profiles. Um, TiVo gives you some very crude basic instructions in their instruction manual here. It's a very good instruction manual, but it's very crude, just basic. Tell it the bed's this big, tell it the bed's this tall, and that's it. It then says import standard PLI settings. So it expects you to know how to configure the software. Now, the big problem with configuring software, some settings are basic to the printer. So nozzle width, line width, 
extrusion, multiplier, bed size, etc. Those are core to the printer. All those settings are fixed. So when I go in here for print, for example, here is my CR10 profile. I doubt you can actually see this. You probably can't. You might. Um, the only setting on here, this main screen, that is actually necessary for me to set for the CR10, for example, is extrusion multiplier and retraction distance. Retraction distance and extrusion multiplier are specific to each printer. Although unlikely, it's even possible that your CR10 will have a different settings for those two functions than my CR10 because things like geography, environment, humidity, temperature, filament, brands, where you are in the world can affect it, but not usually. I doubt the effect is that great. But um, I noticed that with the standard 1.0 multiplier that my CR10 was over extruding. That's an experience thing. I looked at the print, I recognized the flaw I was seeing as over extrusion, so I lowered the extrusion multiplier in Simplify 3D. 0.97 happens to give me pretty ideal prints, 0.96 to 0.98 depending on what I'm printing, but, so I leave it as 0.97 unless I'm doing such a finely detailed part that that matters. Um, retraction 7 millimeters. Why? Because other people who have experience with this printer before I did said 7 to 8 millimeters was the optimal retraction to use, so I chose 7 millimeters. It so far has not given me any problems, so I've had no reason to change it. Maybe someday I'll make a couple test prints tweaking it, but that also becomes a problem because it changes depending on what you're printing. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, layers, I have a standard setup that I use um, as a start. So it's not the default that I use, it's the default I start with. 0.2 millimeter, 3 cubed. So my layer height, 0.2 millimeter, and my top, bottom, and perimeters, 3 cubed, 3, 3, 3. Um, that's three top layers, three bottom layers, and three perimeters. I change that depending on what I'm printing. You know, when I print something like the uh, something big and flat, you know, something like this that might have infill, then I'm going to use more top layers so I don't get pillowing on the top. Um, when I use something like this, obviously I'm going to turn off top layers because I want it to be open on the top. These are not usually hollow; they're solid, and you're making it hollow by telling it to print only one perimeter phase mode. Um, I usually do three bottoms so that it's watertight. If I know the printer has trouble with that, or the filament has trouble with that, I might do four or five bottom layers. Um, but that just depends. On something like this, I jack up the extrusion multiplier after I'm done the bottom layer so that the walls are thicker, so that the print is stronger. Because I don't want these to be super flexible. I want these to be pretty strong so they can handle being held and manipulated. Um, you can't do that when you're printing something that has interior space because you're, te you're technically purposely over extruding, so you want to use the correct extrusion multiplier when you're printing an object like, for example, a Benji. Um, a Benji is a good way to see if you're having problems with that because, for example, if you notice your top layer here on your deck isn't smooth, it's got ridges, well, it usually indicates over extrusion. If you print and you're missing, you see spaces in between those lines, that usually indicates under extrusion. So, also, if your sides aren't smooth, if they have like little bulges sticking out, that can indicate over extrusion. But usually, it's your your let your flat layers where you can determine if you're under or over extruding. It should be pretty smooth. So you'll adjust this until that comes out right. Additions, infill, and support are all independent of any printer. Those are specific to what you're printing, how you're printing, etc. So we don't need to worry about those for this discussion. Temperature and cooling. Again, that's preference. I use 45 for thin beds. I use 55 for thick beds. So Tornado and Enders get 45. CR10 thick glass get 55 because you need more heat to get through the glass. Um, nozzle temperature, my 225 first layer, 200 after that. Again, that changes depending on what you're printing and what filament you're printing with. So that will be completely variable depending on what you're printing and what you're printing with. So, for example, um, the High Five Blue, 215 to 230 minimum, and um, the Apple Green, 200, uh, the, the Sun Lu White, 240. That's what it needed. It actually prints fine at 210, 
but it breaks apart. Okay, so that you will adjust that based on the result you're getting versus the result you want versus a balance between them. Um, let's see what else. Uh, the G code screen, that's just your printer values. You are simply defining the physical limits of the printer to the slicer so it knows. Remember, the printer is absolutely stupid. The CR10 has a x-axis of 300 millimeters. But if you send it a command of x350, it will happily go out to x300 and then keep on trying to go again and again and again. And you'll actually hear it banging its head against the wall. You'll hear the printer go out and go da, 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 and it'll keep sending those commands until it's sent enough commands to get to 350 even though it's sitting there banging up against the end stop because it can't go any further. But the printer has no idea. You have to tell it that. Um, scripts, this is standard stuff. In like Repetier Host, when you tell it I want to do this, this, and this, it just throws these commands into the script. You never see it. It's doing it, but you're not seeing it. Um, so G28 is home all access. That's normal for all printers. Usually if you have a leveling function in the printer, it would be like a G29. Um, that would enable an auto leveling if your printer has that functionality. Um, all the G1 commands, I got them from the hot end. That's just a set of commands to lift up, go over top of the binder clip, come back down, extrude a prime line, and then start to print. Um, the M205 and M204 commands are what I use to control jerk and acceleration. So I set my jerk to 10, my print acceleration to 500, my movement acceleration to 1000. I add that to all my printers now. All my G-code gets that. So that's just a standard part of my starting script. Um, your ending script is simply your G28X0, home the x-axis, I mean get the nozzle away from the print so it doesn't sit there and melt into your print, and then turn off your steppers and your fans and your heat bed and your, your hot end. Um, by the way, if anybody knows a command to turn off the cooling fans with a delay, so either by time or temperature, then turn them off, I'd like to know how to do that, because I understand it's bad to turn off your cooling fan right away, since that could allow your hot end to overheat, your heat break to overheat. Um, and I also have a G1Y285. All that is, is me telling my present, printer to present the build plate to me come all the way out so I don't have to reach in or pull the build plate out, stick out for me so it's ready for me to take my print off. That doesn't affect print quality, that's just convenience. Um, speeds, I standard 50 millimeters a second. All other settings are default, I didn't touch them. Important one, filament diameter, make sure you specify it, measure your filament. Advanced tap. I use allow single extrusion info 50% overlap, and I have only retract when crossing open space and force retraction between layers. That's it. Um, I also have avoid crossing outline for travel movements. What that means is, how do I describe that? Um, let's say I'm printing this as a solid object and I print this and I want to go to here. For whatever reason the printer wants to go from here to here. Well that would be crossing an open space. I don't want it to do that. Because if it crosses an open space that introduces the possibility of collision, introduces the possibility of stringing and oozing, etc. Um, so instead, instead of going from here to here, which would be the fastest movement, instead I tell it, don't do that. It'll print here and then it'll follow this path without extruding any plastic and come over here and then print here which keeps it from going across open spaces, which is one of the reasons a lot of my prints come out so clean. That's a vase, so that doesn't really apply. Now, of course, if there, um, if there is no object between here and here, then it has to cross an open space, of course. Nothing you can do about that. Um, as far as... Now, the settings change depending on what you're printing. Usually what I will change is print speed and print temperatures. Usually all I'll really change. Um, so for example, um, when I go from printing this or printing this. So on this one I'm going to jack up the extrusion multiplier after it's done the bottom layers and I'm going to pick up the speed because they can do it faster. It's one continuous extrusion. This I'm going to slow down the speed a little bit and I'm going to lower the temperature. 
this or it'll increase the temperature since it's never going to stop extruding and since it's self-supporting and since it's never going to retract I can get away with higher temperatures without warping without melting without lifting because it's one continuous extrusion and higher temperatures mean better layer bonding while when you do this higher temperatures could lead to warping and you don't want that okay because then you're going to have collisions and bad layers so I want to lower the temperature for this this also doesn't need as much strength it's got so much infill support and walls that it's strong no matter what temperature I print it while this will get tangibly stronger if I print thicker and hotter um, infill that's an experience thing you know when I do something like this I use 25 percent infill to make sure everything seals up solidly when I do something like the wheels for the print um, level knobs I'll use 10 or 15 percent it doesn't need as much but I'll use three perimeters to keep it strong um, that's it there's nothing special I'm not doing anything weird or magical um, I get to optimal settings a little faster just from experience. You know, I know, okay, the bottom's going to need more retraction, so I might start at five. Um, you know, you might start at one or two and pull your hair out wondering where all your string is coming from while well, you're using a bowden. And I'll tell you right away, okay, lower your temperature, increase your retraction. I know that already, so why in the world would I start with a bad setting that I know is not going to work? Um, I wouldn't, and I won't. There's no reason to. Um, the point is there there are no default settings the default settings for the printer don't matter because the printer is just following commands the settings that we're actually talking about are the settings you put into your slicer and there are no defaults for that they depend on the printer um, there are basic default guides there are guidelines you know no fan on layer zero, max fan for PLA, no fan for ABS, higher temperature for ABS and PLA pluses, lower temperature for regular PLAs, lower temperature for less stringing, but lower temperature also makes the plastic harder to push. So if you have a weak um, extruder stepper motor and you lower the temperature, it might not be able to push the thicker, <coughs> higher viscosity plastic, so you might get skipping. That's why sometimes if I see a, a stepper skipping, I'll try increasing the temperature. Increasing the temperature um, reduces the viscosity, liquefies the plastic more, makes it easier to push through. If that's what's causing the problem, then the problem will go away. Um, that could be indica indicative of a stepper dying. Like with the Z5F, I had to start helping it through and it turns out the stepper was just dying. I replaced the stepper, problem went away. Um, a lot of it comes down to learning how the printer works and you're going to get that by watching videos like this, by watching other people's videos, and by playing with it from experience. It's like sitting down to use a computer. I can't just show you how to do one thing on a computer. It's not quite that easy. You have to have a basic understanding of the UI. You have to have a basic understanding of how the computer works. You have to have a basic understanding that this is a window, this is the title bar for the window, that the file edit view stuff, that's your menu strip, that this is your closed window, that grabbing a corner will allow you to change the size of a window, that hitting an X will close a window, that hitting this button will minimize a window, that you can grab this part of the window here to move it around, that you can tell that this window's front, this window's back, um, that this is the start menu, you have to, that right click gives you a context menu, you have to have that basic knowledge to effectively use the computer. That's why kiosks have proprietary interfaces, so that you don't have to have any knowledge, you just touch what you want. But to use a computer, you have to have some level of understanding of how the basic UI structure works. That's why the Windows UI doesn't change too much throughout the years, because otherwise you have to relearn how to use the computer. They just optimize how effective it is and just keep cleaning it up. It looks prettier, but the basic UI stays the same. Well, the same thing with 3D printers. You have to learn the basics of how 3D printers function. Once you know how 3D printers function, these settings begin to make more sense. Once you learn this setting does this and results in this, this setting does this and results in that, then you begin to learn to recognize when you have a problem. Like, um, oh, I think I already threw it. I know I didn't. Like, um, this here, you know, was an under extrusion issue. Okay? The, the extrusion multiplier was too low, so it wasn't extruding enough plastic. It's too brittle, it comes apart. Okay? 
correct the extrusion multiplier, and now it's plenty strong. No problem. See? It's all good now. Um, it's simply being able to recognize and then correct as necessary. Um, I have less problems because my experience tells me what I need to make those settings to begin with. I know I need, um, th I know this plastic needs a higher temperature. I know um, use thicker layers for this vase, use thinner layers for the benchy, you know, things like that. Um, and it's not even that much. It's um, once you get the core settings, all you're doing is adjusting for what you're printing or adjusting for the kind of plastic you're printing. I never make the speed faster in the G-code. It's always 50 millimeters a second, typically. If I want to go faster, I turn up the feed rate on the printer. If I want to go slower, I turn down the feed rate on the printer. I pick a default speed that I know will work. That will typically work. Um, I can't think of anything else offhand. The other problem, like I said, 99% of printer problems are bed leveling. You have to level the bed. Um, if you have a level bed and you have basic settings that are correct, you have a good start. One thing you could do is if your printer came with a sample file, print the sample file. Usually, not always, usually that sample file is tuned for the printer. So that's why I have default test objects that I print. You know, I have my Rocket, my Benchy, and my Marvin. I always print them, I get the printer printing them well. If I leave that G-code on the printer, I never take it off the SD card. I have a folder on my SD card card test prints. And each printer gets its custom G-code for these three files. If I ever have a problem with the printer, the first thing I do is I go back and print a Marvin. If the Marvin prints okay, then that tells me that the printer is probably okay. There are times where that could be an exception. For example, um, heat creep will appear during time in the print. Um, but usually, if you go back and you print your Marvin and it prints fine, then it's a problem with your settings for the the new file. The printer is probably okay if your standard test object prints okay. So anytime I have an issue, I go back to the test object because I have already printed that, so I know it works. The G code never changes. That G code that's on your SD card is never going to change. It's the same G code that you successfully printed before. So if you take the same successful G code and put it on the same printer and it doesn't print, something changed. Okay? So you either have a malfunction in the printer, hardware problem, or you have a filament problem. Um, that's also why I tell people to go with the eSun PLA Pro because it's I've never ever had an issue with that PLA, so you can remove the PLA from the equation. And then if you have the reliable PLA and the reliable G code and you still have a problem, then you have a mechanical problem on the printer. You want to start checking your extruder, start checking your bolts, start checking your pulleys, start checking your hot ends, start checking for jams, start checking for loose screws, stuff like that. Um, the other part of the problem that people have is um, fit and finish. The printer has to be tight. Okay? So go around, check all your screws, make sure nothing came loose, make sure nothing wiggled free, make sure nothing is out of alignment. No amount of G-code tweaking is going to fix a problem with a loose Bowden dupe. <laughs> so you, you've got to check all these things. That's why the first thing I do when I build a printer is I go through and I tighten every single bolt and screw on the printer. I make sure it's all tight. You'd be amazed how many times you find a loose screw. And it's not necessarily bad QC. Sometimes stuff just comes loose. Sometimes it gets rattled just the right way in shipping and it works itself loose. Um, it happens. But I'll make sure everything's tight. Make sure nothing's worked itself loose. Um, some, I, I once had a bad print because there was a blob around the nozzle. It didn't affect the first couple layers, but as that blob heated up and came down a little bit and touched the print, it started dragging filament. And it was just a, a loose strand of filament, and that's all it was. A little melted plastic on the nozzle. Go near my pliers, clean it all off, and the printer was fine again. So um, that's your basics. There's no magic. I'm not doing anything funny behind the scenes. I'm not doing any kind of special tuning. Um, Simplify 3D might have something to do with it. I don't know. Um, people have reported that they get better results in Simplify 3D than, for example, Cura, but I don't know how much of that's anecdotal and how much of that's actual side-by-side -side testing. I've never used Cura, so I know thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people use Cura fine every single day. So I suspect it's more settings and not just Cura. I think Cura's fine. Um,
I haven't used it because I never have. I don't have a reason to have Simplify 3D. But I suspect there's nothing wrong with this laser. Um, that's it. There's nothing special. The best thing you can do if you have an issue is post pictures and video and ask questions. There's only two stupid questions. The question you intend to be stupid and the question you don't ask. Okay, So ask questions. I love answering questions. I love interacting with people. To me, that's half the fun of doing this is the interaction part. Um, so please post away. Um, I sometimes have trouble coming up with exactly what I need to do videos on. Some things that are obvious and simple to me aren't obvious and simple to everybody else. So I don't even think about doing it, even though everybody's clamoring for it, but nobody tells me. So I don't know. Like the one viewer, he posted a big list of stuff. I'm going to do a video on everything in that list. I just, it's stuff I was like, you want a video on that? Well, duh, of course. Yeah, now, now that I think about it, now that somebody asked for it, now it makes sense. So please, if you want to see content, ask. And I'll do my best to see what I can come up with. Um, you know, I know people want me to test other slicers, but that takes a lot of work. That's time. I can't just load up an STL and Cura and click go because I don't know if there's any idiosyncrasies in the software. So I might be doing the software a disservice by not knowing how to use it. Like I said, you gotta learn the UI. Um, but I'm gonna try it eventually, and I'll I'll play with it. But that's it. I hope that helps explain that there's no magic behind the scenes. There's nothing special going on with how I do that. Um, my prints come out nice because the printers are good. I mean, they're, they're, they're decent, usable machines. Um, one of the reasons I tend to have positive reviews on printers is because I buy printers that I know I want, or I ask for printers that I know I want. My contact at GearBest is allowing me to pick which printers I want, so I am picking the printers that I know I can use, that I think you'll like, that I think are safe and reliable, good machines. The one gamble was the Z5F. I was, I was hopeful for that. That would be a nice, cheap machine, but it's got issues. I would rate that a don't buy. I'll have a final review on that eventually in the next week or so, but that's a, I would avoid that machine unless you're a tinkerer. It's too bad. It had potential but bad execution. I can't even figure out why it's doing what it's doing. I don't, I don't know why. Something's loose, something's wiggling, something's out of alignment, and I can't figure out what it is. Um, I mean, prints, it works, but the prints are not clean. They're just artifacts like crazy. But that's it. Ask away if you have any questions, and I will post the videos. Also, all my videos from now on, one of my standard additions to my uh, description will be a link to my Google Drive which will have the FFF profiles uh, for all the printers that I use on a daily basis. The Tornado one is a beta. I'm still tweaking that but it's pretty much usable. I mean I'm getting great prints out of it. I mean they're coming out wonderful. Um, and I think I know how to get rid of the salmoning. It, it turns out it might be a voltage issue with the stepper. So I just gotta set the correct voltage and they'll be fine. So you guys have a great night. Ask any questions you might have and I'll see you in the next video.